Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. According to the timing, you will be watching at this, uh, at this session, this seminar. I'm pleased to welcome you to this global seminar on understanding contemporary China's visions and goals, uh, effective strategies to respond to Beijing, organized by the Tilotoma Foundation. Tilotoma Foundation is a global organization working in the areas of international relations, financial, environmental, scientific, strategic, and defense policy. I am Dr. Claudia Starita. I'm a visiting fellow for East Asia and China at Tilotoma Foundation. I'm also a lecturer at uh, Sciences Po Lyon in, um, in France. Um, we have been planning this global seminar on this very uh, relevant and important topic since quite a long time. And I'm here to uh, speak and moderate our challenging discussion today. Uh, we have four distinguished speakers that are joining us for this session. The first one is uh, Professor Michele Testoni. He is a professor in the School of International Relations at um, IE University in, uh, in Madrid, in Spain, since 2013. He is also a visiting professor in the Global Economy and Social Affairs Master, co-organized by the University of Venice uh, Ca' Foscari in Italy and the International Labour Organization. His research focuses on international security issues with a very special interest for US foreign policy and NATO. And he is a member of the Spanish Political Studies Association and the Trans um, Transatlantic Studies Association, where he is part of the management committee. From 2010 to 2011, he was also um, associate fellow at the SAIS Europe, so Johns Hopkins University in, um, in Europe, in Bologna. Uh, our second speaker is uh, Professor Baladas Goshal, who is the former chairman of the Center of South and Southeast Asian Studies and one of my favorite universities in the world, I would say, uh, where I spent a long time doing research uh, several years ago, Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. And he is a distinguished advisor for Indian Ocean and Southeast Asian Studies for Tilotoma Foundation. Professor Goshal is one of the most senior and most respected scholars uh, on Saudi, uh, of Southeast Asia in, uh, in India, and he has more than 50 years of experience researching in this, uh, in this area. The, the third speaker will be uh, Dr. Ayu Ersoy. He is a faculty, faculty member at the Department of International Relations of I. Avran University in Turkey. Uh, Dr. Soy is a non-resident fellow also at the Center for Foreign Policy and Peace Research in Ankara, again um, in Turkey. His research interests include Turkey-China relations, uh, China's foreign policy in the Middle East, and sharp power in Chinese foreign policy. He's also the author of the book, uh, Turkish-Chinese Military Relations, Spinning More, Moving Less. Um, last, but of course not least, is uh, Dr. Rory Brown, who is a faculty um, member of the International Studies in the University of Nottingham Ningbo in China. His research interests are in political philosophy and political theory, and in particular is an expert on issue concerning state legitimacy and political obligation. Although today we will be talking about uh, China and China's strategies in Europe with him and with his recent uh, research that he will share with us. To tell you the truth, I think anybody interested in monitoring China's behaviors know very well that understanding China's vision and intentions is difficult. Anticipating them, basically impossible. What we will be trying to do today with the help of our four distinguished uh, presenters is to discuss some tips, some strategies, some ideas to better understand what Xi Jinping's China really wants with the ambition, but we will see whether we will be able to do that, uh, of discussing potential effective strategies to respond to, uh, to Beijing. It is uh, uh, my honor now to leave the floor to Professor Michele Testoni uh, and start what sounds like a challenging and stimulating presentation and discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Michele, for joining us and the floor is yours. <clears throat> Uh, hello, thanks for the kind invitation and good morning to the whole of you from Madrid, Spain, where I'm uh, actually talking to you. Uh, as I requested, my role today will be to try to provide you with a, a few elements of what it seems to be 
uh, still defining but taking shape uh, U.S. strategy toward the Indo-Pacific area, in particular, given the, uh, the, 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 the power shift that we are experiencing in these last few years, the rise of China, but also uh, of other regional actors, India, top of the list, and uh, Vietnam, Indonesia. So the way in which international relations in the early um, 21st century is uh, rebalancing itself toward, uh, toward this area of the world. So I'll try to focus my presentation on two main parts. The first is to try to provide sense uh, to what the United States is, is thinking, is doing, and then uh, trying to sketch a few policy response that it seems the United States uh, is taking, is, is starting to devise, is taking shape, and eventually to assess the, the feasibility and the potential positive and negative results of these uh, of, the, of the strategy of Washington. So, as far as uh, the first point is concerned, so what is the the actual um, strategic thinking about Washington in the Asia Pacific? We need to uh, to to create a framework. I think is always important to provide a little sense of historical and. Uh, strategic sense of the, the role of history, the path dependency, so to speak, of United States foreign policy in this area, taking in, into consideration that the United States uh, has always been an Indo-Pacific uh, actor since the mid-19th century and with ups and with up and down, with lats and shadows, the United States has always had uh, East Asia in, in the radar of its foreign policy, much more than, uh, than Europe and, if we exclude Latin America, with, the, with respect to all other continents in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, what is happening right now, uh, that the United States foreign policy is in the moment of, uh, of great reckoning. We are, as many authors claim, within the so-called fifth debate of United States foreign policy, which cyclically, it seems to, to take place every 20 years in the uneven decades. So the 1930s, the 50s, the 70s, the 90s, and then in the 2010s. And the, the, these debates are shaped, if we adopt a neoclassical realist perspective, from the way in which externalities enter into the, the, the domestic debate of the country and in which uh, the, the, the foreign policy elites in the states, you know, they draw a red line and think and debate among themselves what is happening in the world, what is not going well for us, what, have we, what we should have to do in order to fix uh, our policy and therefore to refix the system. Uh, what is happening today is, is the fifth uh, discord of debate its origin was indeed caused by this process of relative decline uh, that affects the United States itself, coupled with, as we mentioned at the very beginning, the, uh, the, the global imbalances, the way in which the Indo-Pacific theater has turned uh, in the last few years, in the last 10, 15 years, as the most important in, the, in global affairs. And if we look at the way in which uh, two days uh, the United States with the Biden, the, the, the newly elected Biden administration is, uh, is trying to deal with the Indo-Pacific, we therefore need to provide a sense to this debate to which we can say was born indeed with the Obama administration. And so we need to think about what the Obama administration with the so-called pivot to Asia starting from 2009 uh, has readdressed, has repivoting uh, the, the conception of Washington uh, largely from the Middle East toward East Asia, the way in which the Obama administration uh, set or a stage that was already, that was somehow left, uh, uh, somehow up in the air, then the Trump administration and what the, you know, what are the the, the, the current circumstances looking like. Uh, the, uh, the, the, 
what it seems to be that the Obama, that the Biden administration is retaking uh, some of the uh, of, of, of the benchmark issues that Obama set the stage. So a combination of multilateral and bilateral agreement uh, in related to political, military, security, as well as economic issues. But we need to consider the vacuum of power, the, at least from my perspective, the great negative legacy of the Trump administration, and which, which given its erratic behavior and this hyper-nationalistic uh, tendency as creating a vacuum of power in the Indo-Pacific area, has exacerbated the instability of all of the world, and in particular, the sense of, uh, of security dilemma that is very present in the region, and therefore has amplified uh, for the better and the worse, the, the, the rise of China as certainly as a very important actor in the region and potentially a, a global actor. And we can see this, uh, is inconsistencies of the United States foreign policy toward the area in at least four areas. Uh, first is North Korea. Uh, it's not clear yet what Trump tried to do with uh, a meeting with Kim Jong-un. We can speculate about the intention, but certainly what about the results? It's quite doubtful if this measure was successful. Uh, Second, and I think perhaps the most important, is the, the economy. So Trump's decision to scratch uh, the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is now recreated under the you know, relative uh, similar yet minor importance with the so-called TTP, um, the TPP-11. So the, the remainder of the states that were included in this multilateral trade agreement. And this vacuum of power is, of course, filled uh, this is one of the few golden rules we have in politics. Now, when there's a vacuum uh, that is created, somebody will sooner or later will fill it. And this vacuum has apparently started to be, to be filled by the recently signed the Reciprocal Comprehensive Economic Partnership uh, signed uh, a few months ago, led by China. Uh, we have the issue of the technological decoupling which, uh, between the U.S. tech companies and the Western tech companies in general and uh, Chinese companies uh, that the Trump administration made one of the, his most important flagship initiatives. Is something feasible, is something necessary? Huge question marks. Last but not the least is the other decision of the United States to get out from the Iranian nuclear deal, uh, which means that uh, the, 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 and focus on the strategy of maximum pressure over the Iranian regime, which apparently is producing mixed results, one of which is to, to push Iran towards the, uh, into Chinese arms. So what it seems to be that it is actually taking place in the United States with the newly established Biden administration is a sort of a Kenan-esque uh, view about what the United States has to do in the Indo-Pacific area. And I think we all need to remember that uh, last month was the 75th anniversary of the release of the Long Telegram by George Kennan. Of course, with one important and fundamental disclaimer that China is not Russia. And if we want to use Kennan's ideas, Kennan's prescription, we need, of course, to adapt this to the circumstance. Uh, Kennan wrote, and I think we all agree with this, that Russia traditionally suffers a traditional and porting, a traditional instinctive sense of insecurity. And so for Russia, attack is the best defense. Uh, we know that the policy that Kennan recommended to the Truman administration was containment. This is not the case that I think the United States has to do, although some elements of the, uh, the foreign policy elites in Washington seems, to, seems very eager to recreate a sense, a narrative of containment of new Cold War, of an ongoing and spiraling out to see this trap. What it seems to be that the, the best policy course, and then we see if actually the United States is willing and able to take this course, 
it's a much more comprehensive, more subtle, yes, I believe more effective strategy that we could call a manipulation of inter interdependence. It's clear, it's inevitable that China is here to stay for the decades to come. For uh, East Asian, Southeast Asian countries, I'm talking about Japan, South Korea, Vietnam, the Philippines, Thailand, uh, China is an inevitable, is an essential economic and trade partner. But this does not mean that economic interdependencies can translate also in political and uh, military interdependence. And this, and this is, I believe, in this very subtle but very fundamental fold of international relations that the foreign policy, the grand strategy that should survive the Biden administration itself, you know, should lean to. And we are reading in the, in the last few weeks, in the last few days, a, a, a huge array, an, an increasing array of papers, of report, of contributions, uh, according to this, that, that follow this line of thinking. You now that the United States should try to exploit, of course, to hinder the greatest strength, largely economic and commercial of China, uh, and try to maximize the weaknesses of Beijing, which is in particular the, the rising yet not fully fledged military instrument, and the fact that China does not have as yet soft power. So a policy that I would, would personally compare not to Kennan's containment, but to what NATO did or started to do in the late 1960s with the Harmel report with relation to the Soviet Union. So sort of dual track policy, given the fundamental disclaimer that um, I talked about a few minutes ago. So to engage inevitably uh, China in economic and technological terms, but at the same time to create an environment that is not only and largely um, opposing to China, but is or should be uh, that should favor uh, the, the, the requirements, the necessities in terms of economic, political, social, cultural development of East Asian and Southeast Asian countries, in particular their societies. Uh, in particular, democratic values, um, cultural economic development, uh, the vitality of societies that are demographically growing. This, I think, is one of the greatest uh, challenges and opportunities that we are, I think, not enough talking about. Last but not least is, the, is this attempt, and this I'm going, I'm, I'm, I'm concluding, is finally, and I think that this is, is a very positive result, but of course, where is this going to? This revitalizing the rev revitalization of the quadrilateral alliance that was a George W. Bush administration project. The Obama administration developed, although in a very aloof and unstructured way, uh, the Trump administration almost completely scratched this project, referring bilateral relations. And now the Biden administration seems to have started uh, it's new course in foreign policy with full steam ahead in this, in this case. So a, a, I would say a comprehensive strategy of economic, commercial, and social civic engagement with China and the whole of East Asian and Southeast Asian countries, and the attempt to revitalize political and military relations, in particular to, uh, to make use of the fact that the United States fleet remain the sheriff of the oceans. And in this case, India is inevitably uh, the cherry upon the cake of this project. We will see in the decades to come, in the years to come, a, 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 a pivot to India, United States foreign policy, but also a pivot to the United States, so to speak, of India. This is, I think, it's, uh, it's one of the questions uh, that lingers in today's debate. So if I conclude my, my presentation, I may say that there are, um, there are three points 
uh, there are three questions. Excuse me. Uh, there are three questions uh, that we need to take into consideration. First, is the United States willing and able to have the strength, the intelligence, and the, the capability to raise enough domestic resources consensus to set, to set up this new and very ambition uh, global strategy, in particular with, with relation to the Indo-Pacific? Is the Sino-American to see the trap going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy? Last and not the least, what about India? Will India accept this challenge? In what way will India in the next few years position itself? Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Michele. Thank you very much for your uh, for your contribution. I was uh, while I was listening to you, there were a couple of things that I was just uh, noticing. I mean, I basically I, I agree with you, and uh, but I do have two questions for you. So, first of all, you know, you mentioned quad, and uh, yesterday, Tiro Thomas Foundation um, organized another uh, seminar that was exactly focusing on that, and then in the perspective of uh, of quad. And I also agree with the fact that we cannot deny the necessity, you know, and that uh, for uh, Asian countries to remain economically engaged with, with China. But do you think that it can be feasible to maintain this equilibrium based on economic, economic cooperation, yes. Strategic cooperation, no, because we prefer, we still continue to be afraid of China. So we prefer to have the United States on our side. And do you think that maybe re-engaging the, the quad related discussion could persuade um, Asian countries uh, about the fact that United States are there to stay because you also mentioned TPP and I think that the fact that Donald Trump decided to step back from the TPP created lots of um, doubts in terms of uh, in terms of the long-term uh, American commitment in Asia so maybe this kind of engagement and the relaunch of the quad debate and I agree with you India needs to be part of the game to make it realistic and to make it even stronger could potentially create some room for this uh, equilibrium of economy yes and strategy no and on, on another little point um, you said, and once again, I agree that China is not yet a very strong soft power, but the kind of anti-China narrative that is uh, becoming uh, sharper and sharper, I would say, all over the world could further limit uh, China's uh, capacity to develop its own soft power or make it even harder to, to, to make it for China even harder to succeed. In this, uh, in this challenge, what do you think? Um, well, it's the first question is absolutely correct. I think this is the, uh, perhaps the most important, the most thorny question we need to, to answer to, uh, which I think it should be, um, it should be explored in the very short term uh, because the United States uh, the Biden administration has a profoundly, at least in economic terms, as a profoundly domestic agenda, which is typical of all democratic administrations. Uh, I doubt whether uh, the United States, in, in purely economic terms, has something more to offer, economically speaking, indeed, uh, to that bunch of countries that China has not already offered them. That's the question. Uh, the, the, what the United States can uh, provide countries like uh, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, uh, the East Asian countries, that China cannot offer them already. Uh, coupled with the fact that the United States, uh, I mean, the, the, the so-called populist wave that has elected Trump is hardly over. And so there's, I think there's a profound trade-off between the means and the visions that the United States is, uh, is engaging. But I think in the, in the medium term, you're absolutely right. So if the situation in the Indo-Pacific area 
increasingly reduce the areas of gray and starts to become even more black and white, at the end of the day, uh, countries have to choose. And this is, some, is a question, is a requirement that is not only worth for the Indo-Pacific, but also to Europe. So we need to, the third ways are hardly possible. And as far as the, uh, what was your other question? Uh, ah, the, the, the soft power could be, I think that this is, uh, that it could be the, the, the China as yet has not provided any um, empirical way to, to, to define its own soft power. Yeah, we see a proliferation of Confucian Institute all over the world. Uh, we know that Chinese society and Chinese mentality is different from the, at least the European, the Western one. They have a different conception, at least, of what means time in politics. They are not in a hurry. Uh, it's quite difficult to answer this question, but certainly if this black and white, uh, you know, division will take place with country in the Indo-Pacific area uh, deciding to lean more, again, more on the United States, than to China and considering uh, the Trump administration as a sort of black, temporary, limited black swan, maybe your question uh, may receive a positive answer. So maybe this could, could hinder uh, the, 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 the attempt of China to develop its own uh, uh, the, the, the soft power. Soft power. Mm -hmm. Which, just to conclude, I think the, 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 is the, the fact that China has problems in soft power is, really, is showed by the very recent polls in which uh, the, the, the perception of China is decreased in the last few years. So the pandemic and the health diplomacy notwithstanding, if I'm not mistaken, only Italy has a much, is a more positive image than China with respect to all other countries in the, in the Western basin. So That's this right. could be a potential, you know, food for thought also in this, in this case. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you to you, Michele. Thank you very much. And me, I would like to, uh, to leave the floor now to Professor Baladas Goshal to, to check what he has to add on this debate and what China wants, which is China's vision. And can we really understand uh, the, 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 the China's global ambitions? Thank you very much, <clears throat> Professor Goshal. You're very welcome. Thank you. Now, I think I'll start with a couple of propositions. The first proposition is, which I have been holding for a very long period of time, from 2007 onwards. I gave a talk at University of Illinois, uh, Urbana-Champaign in 2007, where I made a couple of observations, and it may sound that I've just paraphrasing them today. The first proposition is that the West, India, and many other countries misunderstood, miscalculated, underestimated the intent and ambition of China. They may have read China through different documents, statements, and things of that sort. They might have thought that China could be accommodated into this world by admitting it, by granting certain status in terms of China's membership of WTO, investment, trying to, you know, help China to develop economically, eradicate poverty, and things of that sort. In other words, by managing the rise of China, they thought that they would be able to control China's intent and ambitions. I think they made one simple mistake. That is, a nation with a victim mentality can never be managed and can never emerge as a great power in that sense of the term. The second proposition that I'll make is that the West wanted to 
enjoy the benefits of cheap economic goods, cheap consumer goods for their own citizens. And that's why they invested heavily, both Japan, United States, invested heavily in China for cheaper consumer goods so that they could satisfy their own consumers. So the Western consumers actually came under seize, some kind of, under the Chinese spell. China emerged in the process as one of the, you know, most developed manufacturing hub, a factory of the world, all because of the West and the help of China. The third proposition is that while China was accommodated to a certain extent, managed, and at least China also wanted to utilize its charm offensive in order to make it acceptable to the rest of the world. But in course of time, you know, the hubris. Once China took, China was able to develop itself in a hubris began to set in. And that actually brought about this particular sort of state of things. The fourth proposition that I would like to make is that, you know, China eventually overplayed its hands. In fact, the entire stability of the Indo-Pacific region or Southeast Asia or other regions at least depended to a large extent on some kind of an understanding between the United States and China. Even if there were competition, there were occasional clashes of interest, but by and large, there were certain understanding between the United States, a convergence of interests in the so-called Asia-Pacific region. And because of this conversant, I mean, the conversant, convergent interests between the United States and China, the peace and stability was somewhat maintained despite occasional troubles because of Chinese actions in the South China Sea. Now, that understanding actually broke down now beginning from the time of Trump, beginning with the trade war, and various other problems that started between the United States and China. Now that also created a tremendous amount of you know, uneasiness amongst the neighbors of China. In fact, Southeast Asian countries, I would not come to India at this moment, maybe at a later stage I'll take up India, but I'll take Southeast Asia initially, because the Southeast Asian countries actually grew because of the China's economic development. Without China's massive economic development, ASEAN countries would not have been able to develop economically. So they had obviously certain interest in terms of engaging China economically in a big way. And they were also small countries, lack of capital resources, Chinese investments were coming, Belt and Road Initiative, and all that kind of thing had helped these countries considerably in terms of development, economic development. But at the same time, there were worries also because of China's bellicosity, its aggressive intentions in South China Sea. But somehow, because of the balance that was struck, because of the convergence of US and China till a certain period of time, they thought this could be managed and they pursued a kind of a dual track strategy. On the one hand, engage them economically. On the other hand, kind of soft, you know, hedging, soft balancing the you know, China through some kind of arrangements with the United States and with certain other middle powers in the region, like Japan, Australia, India, and others. But the some total of all this is that particularly this entire assumption about China made 
began to change, particularly with the emergence of Xi Jinping. Now, who thought maybe China's time has come and China must realize its goals and ambitions? Now, one point also I have to mention that like China did not behave like other you know, rising powers in the history. In fact, China beat its opponents in their own game. It's not that China committed aggression against them like Hitler did or some others did. China tried to take the best out of the best. Its technology, its all other sort of you know, qualities and tried to you know, build itself in terms of military strength, in terms of economic strength and also technologically. And technologically in certain areas like on 5G and others, in fact, China has developed even more than the West. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why the clash of interests began between the United States and China to a certain extent. Yeah. So, you know, China tried certain strategy and tactics, which actually the West adapted at one time, point of time in order to establish the hegemony and supremacy in the world. So, but you know, all these things, you know, Deng Xiaoping's warning or some kind of portion that <clears throat> by, I mean, uh, hide your strength and bide your time, that was over. Xi Jinping wanted to realize his Chinese dream and he began to feed the Chinese citizens with all kinds of nationalist rhetorics and the great power status and all that kind of thing. So it was almost imperative on the part of China to establish itself as the, you know, as a challenger to the United States, particularly establish its hegemony in the in in in, in Asia Pacific region and drive the West. Now that's where actually the problem started. Now, as I said, the Southeast Asian countries they began to adapt a kind of a dual strategy, engage at the same time soft balance. I think that also has come under major strain at this point. And all the institutions like ASEAN developed over the years, they were able to retain a certain amount of stability, but now it has become quite ineffective. East Asia Summit, the, all the institutions that they have built have not been able to resolve much of the contradictions. So that's why you see the emergence of things like Quad and other international arrangements to which they're trying to supplement, not replace the existing uh, uh, structures. In fact, there is no one single structure that can really absorb all the interests, interests of all the countries and at the same time emerge as a kind of a single architecture, security architecture in the region. I think it has to be, you know, small, small initiatives and that would combine together to manage somehow the peace and stability of this, of this region. I think the final point that I would like to make is, I think that balance is slightly under why slightly under heavy stress at this moment? Because of China's ambition, China's bellicosity, China's you know, artificial island building, encroaching on other territories, including India and all that, that has really put a strain on this entire thing. And I think I did mention to Claudia and in, in my note to her, saying that recently in at the end of January, the Southeast Asian, that Institute of Southeast Asian Studies has brought about a report whereby they found that while China has become emerged as one of the most important countries in this region, but the trust quotient for China has diminished considerably. Simultaneously, the trust quotient for the United States, which had gone down quite considerably during Trump period has gone up, including in countries like Cambodia, which is almost like a client state of China. And this change, although may not be translated immediately into the region, but it may 
in fact lead to a lot of, you know, kind of, if not coalition building, but some kind of arrangements through which there would be a certain change in the balance, not in the balance of power, but the manner and the institution through which China would be, would like, to, I mean, they would like to control China's ambition. In fact, very significant is that in the Biden administration, in the case of Philippines, you know, some of the statements that the Biden administration made is that they would respect the security treaty that they have with the Philippines, including any attack even in the South China Sea areas in the interest. Now, that itself is a great sort of addition to what the United States has said so far. Now, it again may not be translated immediately, but it may mean some kind of sort of shift in the attitude of some of those countries. Philippines approach to India to buy the Brahmos missiles, despite the fact that Chinese threat is hanging like a Democles sword over their head. Yet they have been now trying to openly seek the help of India for the Brahmos missiles. And they're also hedging with other countries in the region. So the picture that emerges is still very unclear. I think it still would emerge, although people have been talking about quad, particularly from India's point of view, this has been a great, what I call a shot in the arm, like the kind of vaccines that we are taking uh, against the COVID. So quad summit would be a kind of a shot in the arm of the four countries, which were really facing tremendous kind of pressure from China. Australia was really under pressure, uh, um, the kind of chewing gum under the bootstrap, the kind of insulting words and stopping the uh, import of wine and many of the products that they were Chinese were exp importing from Australia. So they were really reading from that ban on the imports. And so is Japan, you know, facing every now and then the wrath of the, you know, Chinese Coast Guards. And the recent law that China passed on the Coast Guard, that it has the authority to uh, shoot at any ship, fire at any ship that they find is within their perceived sphere of interest, I mean, territorial interest in South China Sea, has created quite a bit of an uneasiness in the minds of many of the South Asian countries. The Indonesian uh, defense minister has come out with a statement on that that this might lead to an accidental conflict. So is the statement from Vietnam, as well as from uh, <clears throat> Philippines. So I think the situation is still under kind of a, you know, uncertain stage, but things are gradually emerging. And to my mind, what is going to be a reality, but in order to become much more effective, the Quad has to expand itself, not through a regular or a kind of a definitive membership of some of the ASEAN members, but at least through indirect support and through consultation, coordination, and some kind of economic incentives or economic uh, agenda, if they could be brought into the quad arrangements, not in a formal kind of an alliance or kind of any kind of, but in a kind of partnership. That may be the trend that might be emerging in the coming days. I think I'll stop at this stage and then maybe I'll take up some of those uh, if there are questions. Thank you very much, Professor Gosha. Thank you very much for your, uh, for your insightful presentation. 
there are at least two points that I would like to, to, to further discuss with you. First of all, I never thought about changing a little bit the scope, I don't want to say the nature, but the scope of a quad to make it even more solid and even more profitable to a certain extent for countries that are um, called to join it, to, to, to effectively do it, you know? And I was wondering whether you might, you might think that it could be good, especially staying in line with uh, your analysis, which is uh, uh, goes in the same direction as the one of uh, Michele Testoni before. So that with Southeast Asia, we have this equilibrium to be identified between engaging China and balancing China and the threats that are coming from China. So I wonder whether you might imagine that Quad could be um, that Southeast Asian countries, for example, could be associated to a certain extent to quote and whether this would be positive or not. And then I would like to go back to your very first point because I completely agree with you. This is something that I repeat to my students all the time. I mean, the West and not only the West got China wrong. So, and also we continue to get China wrong because it looks like that more and more we continue to make mistakes to think that China will behave in this way or will be satisfied with a certain accommodation, but in fact, it's not the case. But I'm, I'm sure, because with your experience on, uh, on Southeast Asian uh, studies, I, I'm sure you, you have read many uh, reports written by Lee Kuan Yew. And I remember when it was in the 90s, so after Tiananmen, that um, he was saying that one day, and he was dating this change in, uh, in 30, 40 years. So Lee Kuan Yew was saying in the 90s, in 30, 40 years, the, the change that China will experience will completely, um, how to say, restructure the existing balance of power. And China will become a country that will not only, you know, being just uh, one of the major actors in the international scene, but China will be a country that will reshape the, our history. Actually, what he said was uh, a country that will stay in the history of the humanity. So it looks to me, and not only for this declaration, the Lee Kuan Yew always got China right, but nobody was listening to him. How is that possible in your opinion? In two sentences, I'll yeah. answer your question. Li Kuan Yu wanted that China should be a stable factor in international politics, and China should be given a certain place. But I think he got also wrong because you know all said and done, Li Kuan Yu was also a Chinese, so yeah. there was a certain sense of you know affiliation to no. the ethnic kind of thing. But he was also wrong. He couldn't also think that China would have Xi Jinping. Fortunately, he died even before Xi Jinping. Before Xi. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very you. much. Okay. Thank you very okay. much for Thank being you. with Thank us. You. Thank you. So um, now we will change a little bit the, the I would say the, the, the orientation of uh, our seminar. So of course we will continue to look at China, but we will try to go more in depth and understanding what are the, the, um, the intention, let's say the strategies that China is using to uh, gain more influence in uh, um, other areas. And first of all, we will uh, discuss with uh, Dr. Eyu Persoy about Chinese strategies in Turkey, and then we will move on uh, Europe, which will, uh, which will be another very interesting uh, case studies to, to analyze. Uh, please, Dr. Ersoy, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Claudia. I will uh, make a PowerPoint presentation, uh, if I may. Okay, I guess you can see my presentation here. Uh, I am a person from Ahiran University in Turkey, and I will talk about today uh, Chinese influence attempts in Turkey. And I will talk about four main points. Uh, I will talk about the objectives of these influence attempts. I will talk about the main instruments through which these influence attempts are carried out, and I will talk about the efficacy 
of Chinese influence in Turkey to a, to an extent it has been effective uh, in the last decade. And finally, I will talk about the lessons that could be drawn from the Turkish experience from Turkey-China relations. These will be these four points will be my presentation's outline. So, what are the primary objectives of Chinese influence attempts in Turkey? Uh, these influence attempts, the primary objectives of these influence attempts, can be divided into three. Uh, there are security-related objectives, there are economy-related objectives, and there are identity-related objectives. Here, I would like to highlight the fact that Chinese influence attempts are generally discussed in reference to exclusively security and economy. Identity dimension of Chinese influence is usually dismissed, but uh, it is as influential and important as security and economy. So these are the three primary objectives of Chinese influence. So what are the security related objectives? Of course, uh, there, are, there can be and there are a variety of security related objectives, but the paramount objective from the Chinese perspective in Turkey-China relations is the elimination, and if not possible, the containment of Turkish criticisms pertinent to the Uyghur issue. As you know, the Uyghur issue is now uh, a matter of contention in the relations between China and many states in the world. And here, Turkey occupies a pivotal position because the Turkish people share both a religious affinity and an ethnic affinity with Uyghurs. Uyghurs are a Muslim Turkic people inside China. Uh, so Turkey's silence if not possible, at even tested approval of Chinese treatment of Uyghurs can be used by the Chinese officials as a discursive leverage in their engagements with other countries, like in Central Asia, Chinese officials can say, look, Turkey, even Turkey with a Muslim and Turkic affinity with Uyghurs uh, does not consider the issue uh, a matter of dispute. The same can be said in the Muslim world by Chinese officials. So, both as a Muslim and Turkic uh, nation, country, Turkey's position is very critical here from the Chinese perspective. There are, of course, economy related objectives, and like in so many countries around the world, China here aspires to attain a prominent role and share in Turkey's economy. Uh, and uh, here, objectives can be divided according to the issue areas like trade related objectives, investment, and finance. And finally, there are identity related objectives. Here, China promotes certain seemingly shared identities in Turkey, such as. Uh, what is called Eurasianism. In Turkey, we call it Avra Sejilik. In English, it becomes Eurasianism. So promotion of these shared identities is important to shift foreign policy outlooks and attitudes in the Turkish public opinion. Uh, of course, towards a uh, position more favorable to China. And here, an important point is this. Uh, Chinese discursive strategy involved both subversion and promotion. By so subversion, I mean uh, subversion of the already established uh, identities inside Turkey, like Turkish, Turkey's Western identity. Uh, this discursive strategy at the same time aims at undermining or weakening Turkey's Western identity, while at the same time promoting uh, identities more favorable to China. So in terms of the instruments, what are the instruments of Chinese influence attempts in Turkey? Uh, 
the primary instruments uh, are related to economy, identity, and society, and they involve material and symbolic resources China can and do mobilize. Here, again, I would like to highlight that in terms of resources, in general, uh, only material resources China employ in its pursuit of influence abroad are discussed. However, here intangible, symbolic, non-material resources are also important for the achievement of effective influence abroad. So there are economy-related instruments. Uh, here, here one point, I discussed Chinese objectives, uh, security, economy, and identity-related objectives. But I'd like to uh, emphasize that these, the pursuit of these objectives are not peculiar to China. All states, especially emerging and rising powers, pursue these objectives in other countries. These are not peculiar to Turkey-China relations. These are general objectives for all emerging powers. In terms of instruments, there are economy-related instruments. Here, financial resources constitute the dominant instrument of Chinese influence attacks in Turkey. For example, uh, Chinese credit becomes a critical asset for Turkey's economy uh, because of the budget deficit Turkey now has, or for a long time have, has had, and uh, for the support of the central bank reserves. And all, uh, of course, Chinese investment in the Turkish economy has become also critical. There are uh, identity-related instruments. Uh, here, symbolic resources are utilized in public diplomacy for identity purposes. One important uh, avenue for the mobilization and utilization of these resources is China Radio International. It is Turkish service is very active in Turkey, and there are now four Confucius Institutes uh, active also in Turkey. And finally, there are society-related instruments. Here, uh, from the Chinese perspective, the promotion of social and political groups in Turkey, uh, sympathetic to China, of course, uh, has become an important instrument uh, and this promotional strategy is based on the mobilization of material as well as symbolic resources. So coming, uh, coming to the third main point of my presentation, to what extent Chinese influence attempts have been successful in Turkey? What is the efficacy of them? We can say that uh, China's influence attempts are to a large extent successful in the last decade and the success of Chinese influence can be observed in structural shifts in bilateral relations, in the discursive and behavioral shifts in Turkish foreign policy and the status of pro-Chinese groups inside Turkey and one by one let's see them. Now the structure of bilateral relations has become uh, more tilted in favor of China. Today, Turkey is more accommodative to China compared to the past. For example, in 2017, Turkish Foreign Minister Mevlüt Çavuşoğlu, while visiting Beijing, declared that Turkey sees China's security as its own security. And in terms of economy, China is now the third biggest import market for Turkey after Russia and Germany. And Chinese credit, as I said, has become very critical for Turkey. For example, as far as I know, Turkish Central Bank uh, has swap agreements with two countries. One is Qatar in the Middle East, Turkey's close partner, and the other is China. And uh, we see Confucius Institutes in four universities in Turkey, but against the principle of uh, reciprocity, we do not see a Unusemre Institute in China. Unusemre Institutes are the equivalents of Confucius Institutes. They are established to 
promote Turkish language and culture abroad, and while they are operational in more than 40 countries, and while there have been attempts to establish one uh, in Beijing, in China, uh, Turkey has not managed to uh, establish a UNICEF Institute inside China. So uh, this is also an indication of the shifts in the structure uh, of bilateral relations between Turkey and China. And of course, uh, we can observe the efficacy efficiency of Chinese influence in the discursive and behavioral shifts in Turkish foreign policy. About the Uyghur issue, for example, there is now a blanket silence today in Turkey, especially on the part of the government. And uh, a decade ago, uh, the Turkish government, the, the same Turkish politicians actually, used to be very critical of Chinese treatment of Uyghurs, Uyghur minority inside China. But today, uh, there is a deafening silence inside Turkey, which is of course heavily criticized by opposition parties in Turkey. And there is now the issue of the Treaty of Extradition. It was signed in 2017, referred to the Turkish Grand National Assembly in 2019, and uh, waiting uh, to be ratified. And the future of this extradition treaty actually will tell much about uh, the efficacy of Chinese influence in Turkey. And uh, finally, we can observe uh, Chinese influence, which it, it is achievement uh, in the states of pro-Chinese groups in Turkey. Now these groups are more vocal, more active and more assertive and uh, their participation in Turkish politics and uh, political and social debates is highly critical for China due to the local legitimization of Chinese policies. For example, when a Chinese ambassador makes a, a speech in another country, it can be criticized and debated and rebuked. But when the same speech is made by a local actor, social or, or political actor, it is not subject to the same level of criticism because now it has become a local debate it has become indigenized, localized. And similarly, the localization of Chinese arguments are also very important, is also very important from the Chinese perspective. So which lessons uh, can be drawn from the Turkish experience uh, in terms of resisting Chinese influence? First, resilience becomes a pivotal issue here social and especially economic strength, stability and resilience uh, provide countries with more uh, leverage in their dealings with China. Otherwise, vulnerability can be exploited uh, by China and of course by all other external actors. So resilience is a critical parameter here. A second, uh, transparency is required inside uh, states. Uh, otherwise, disinformation campaigns uh, can be very widespread and very effective and absence of adequate information uh, would be an impediment to uh, clearly first understand China, the extent of Chinese engagement and to respond effectively. And freedom, uh, freedoms actually are required for an open discussion of Chinese engagements. Uh, here, freedom of speech, uh, freedom of information, freedom of media uh, become very critical to freely discuss the advantages and disadvantages of countries' engagements and relations with China, and uh, respecting basic, basic rights and liberties inside countries is very important to secure and sustain moral high ground uh, in dealings with China. 
For example, uh, in many Asian countries, there are Muslim minorities, and respecting the rights and liberties of these Muslim minorities would provide countries with additional uh, moral power uh, in their dealings with China. These uh, would be the lessons that could be drawn from the Turkish experience. Here I finish my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, you for your very interesting presentation. You know, when I was um, when I was listening at the, the your description of the the evolution, if you want, of China's position vis-a-vis -vis Turkey, and then the efficacy and the successful of uh, China's policy in Turkey, I was trying to ask myself. I mean, is Turkey going to be an exception or the norm? So I don't know, because I understand that your area of research is Turkey, but can, do you see some, uh, some opportunities for China to um, do exactly the same or, and, and then uh, being able to, to reverse, if you want, the relationship with another country in uh, its own term and on its, uh, on its side? Um, in the future, or you think, because you know Turkey very well, and you think that China really got the right moment to uh, achieve what is a, it has been able to, to achieve, and not necessarily the same uh, situation will develop somewhere else, and so you are more skeptical about, uh, let's say, the extension of this kind of uh, success in terms of China's ambitious foreign policy, I would say. Yeah, the issue has here uh, two dimensions, one for countries, uh, one external, one internal. In the Turkish case, Turkey has been experiencing uh, serious problems with its traditional allies, uh, especially the United States. So this problematic situation for Turkey uh, increases Turkey's isolation in regional and global politics. So. Uh, prevention of self-isolation uh, is an important uh, factor here to uh, deal with Chinese influence attempts. Uh, isolation weakens uh, Chinese uh, countries' positions in uh, their bargainings with China, and it gives more freedom of maneuver uh, for Chinese uh, state. And secondly, the internal dimension here, uh, stability, strength, and resilience inside the country, especially in terms of economy, is highly critical. Uh, states with uh, states financially uh, stable and resilient, uh, as I see it, uh, can more easily uh, decline Chinese requests uh, for more uh, influence inside uh, the countries, inside their own territory, in terms of investment, in terms of uh, financial credit, in terms of social engagement, etc. For example, Sweden uh, decided to close down all Confucius Institutes, and the Swedish government uh, managed to do that because it, has, uh, it doesn't have serious weaknesses to be exploited uh, by the Chinese government. So it, uh, it has the capacity to, uh, to execute whatever decision it, it, it has taken. But this doesn't seem to be the case for Turkey due to both ex problems in its foreign policy and problems in its domestic uh, policies, both economic and political. So for countries, for all countries in the world, uh, taking care of it as uh, traditional alliance relationships uh, is very important and taking care of uh, development, progress and stability inside their own territory uh, is the other uh, important factor.
I understand. Thank you very much. I mean, from what you say, I think we should be careful and continue to, to monitor very carefully also the evolution of the relationship between China and Russia, because China, uh, Russia is another country that might suffer for um, uh, isolation and self-isolation. And indeed, we have already seen a very active uh, Beijing to uh, to, 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 to relaunch and reconnect with, uh, with Moscow, with, let's say, uh, different results according to, to the topic. But definitely this is an area that we need to continue to monitor. I wonder what, if we could say the same about Europe and then whether there too we can see that China is using the same approach and, and just taking advantage of some windows of opportunity to, to, to reshape, reframe the relationship with European countries and in which European countries, we cannot consider all the European countries in um, having, sharing the same relationship with China. So I would like to uh, leave the floor to uh, Dr. Rory Brown at the moment and, and try to uh, see uh, with him, which is the situation in, uh, in Europe and what we can do to counterbalance China in, uh, in Europe. Thank you very much, Dr. Brown, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, actually, I would say from watching your um, presentation, I, which I really enjoyed, there is a lot of similarities actually between what you were saying and what is emerging in Europe, I feel. But um, I'll just, I also have a PowerPoint, so I'll just mm -hmm. begin that. So, And thank you again for um, inviting me to um, give this presentation. It's um, a real honor, thank you. Um, so just to introduce myself, um, my name is um, Claudia, thank you for introducing me, is um, Ruri, um, from the University of Nottingham Ningbo's or the University of Nottingham's China campus. I should probably maybe just say before beginning, um, although I normally teach in mainland China, I'm not currently speaking from mainland China. Um, I'm currently in Edinburgh, so I'm maybe worth just as a subtext saying I'm not currently in China. Um, so to um, begin, um, I have three parts to this presentation. Um, I'm first of all going to consider the overall vision and strategy that Beijing may be applying towards Europe. Then um, a couple of examples. And finally, um, how this has been received and how Europe might be responding to this, both discussion certain states as well as the European Union. Okay, so the overall vision and strategy. Often when it's talked about Beijing's strategy to Europe, the idea of carrot and stick is used. The idea that they're trying to gain influence by using certain carrots and certain sticks. So for example, of carrots, um, you've got things like high profile visits, offering politicians visits to China, opening of transport links, sister agreements. Really what we're talking about mainly so is promises of investment into um, Europe. Also more recently, since the pandemic, there's also the mask dis diplomacy and vaccination diplomacy emerging, which is also worth considering. In terms of sticks, what we see is sort of the cancellation or shunning of representatives from countries and um, cancellation of transport links, the withdrawing of investment. And um, some more harsher ones we might consider, such as embassies organizing protests in certain countries and also sort of the reprimanding of countries and their embassies. One thing to stress here is that there's no one size fits all. It's not like there's one sort of blanket approach to Europe. It's very much um, pragmatic depending on the different countries and the temperatures in those countries, political temperatures. One thing that might be worth observing is this is particularly pragmatic and aimed, I think, um, is feeding off what you asked to begin with, um, Claudia, on certain countries. And we see in particular countries that might be disillusioned with the EU, such as Greece, Hungary, or, um, sorry, I can't see my own presentation. Greece, Hungary, or sorry, Italy, um, being particularly targeted as they might be seen to be disillusioned with the EU. So pragmatic and maybe focusing on these countries. Now, of course, this carrot and stick tells us something about maybe the strategy, but doesn't tell us about the overall vision. So what, does Beijing want? What's its vision? One thing I would argue, and again, I think this really fits on with the last presentation, is the focus on identity or ontological security. Um, the idea that it's China is wanting sort of validation 
of its identity of the truths that make up its world vision more than anything from Europe. Okay, so it's more this battle for truth and trying to get European countries to accept um, China's worldview. And I wanted to highlight this because I think it differs, especially to what we talked about, say, in sort of um, Southeast Asia or the Pacific or, or India in particular, where it can be much more about, you know, traditional security threats, border disputes being sort of the main tensions. In Europe, we find much more this contestation over truth and China wanting to get Europe to recognize some of the truths it wants to propagate. So kind of, I know that's kind of abstract. So to give some kind of um, examples, we have the truth over China's sovereignty, questions of Tibet, Taiwan, and increasingly important, what is the truth regarding the situation in Hong Kong? Also China's human rights record, what is the truth that is occurring? Um, especially um, in China, Xinjiang with the Uyghur population, because of course China claims that a lot of what's on European media is fabrication and not truth. And increasingly important, the truth over COVID-19, where it began with China increasingly insisting it didn't begin in China, it began somewhere else. And also who is fighting the virus best and in terms of did China try and initially cover up what happened in Wuhan? And is the Chinese socialist norms better and more effective at combating an emergency than Western liberalism? So this kind of contestation over these truths and um, some more about sort of the truth about China's sovereignty and what's going on internally, others more international regarding COVID-19. So kind of to summarize what um, I'm seeing as the main objection, I'm um, sorry, the main objective of China in Europe would be to try and get these validations, get validation for its claims and truths of its worldview. And it offers um, carrots in return for validation of these views. And it will offer sticks if countries criticize the human rights record or, or engage, say, with Taiwan. So it's kind of a pragmatic carrot and stick approach to try and get these truths um, recognized. I'm stressing the word pragmatic here. Sometimes it might even appear erratic um, in what truths are more important at different times. To add to this, um, I might consider one other objective, which is often, um, sorry, one an objective which is often claimed of China, certainly from Europe, that is trying to break up the EU. I put a question mark next to this because it's something that China would certainly deny. It denies it's trying to break up the EU. It claims it's a firmly supportive of, of the European integration process, but the EU is increasingly seeing as China as attempting to break up um, and undermine it, both in terms of trying to pull especially Eastern Europe away from the Western European states and under a more Beijing orbit, and also in getting states to accept China's worldview in that process undermining liberal EU norms. Again, I would say China would probably reject this. They would say this is um, being overly suspicious, but it's certainly something I think Europe is suspecting. So some examples of this. So I've got two examples just to talk of briefly. The, seven, the first one is the 17 plus one mechanism, um, which is the main mechanism by which China is accused of trying to pull Eastern European states away from the EU and undermine it. And the second one is a more contemporary mass diplomacy, which I'm using as an umbrella term to refer to kind of just strategy and diplomacy in relation to COVID-19. So the 17 plus one, um, I'm, if you're not familiar, is a platform organized by China with 17 other European states, some in the EU, some not in the EU. And one of the main acquisitions, certainly from um, the EU, is that this is an attempt to try and create a division between the seemingly less developed Eastern European states and the more developed Western European states. And a good example of this um, this year is Xi is saying he will, or offering to increase or double food imports from Eastern Europe into China over the next five years. And many would see that as kind of a, an attempt to divide um, Eastern Europe from Western Europe amongst states like Poland, especially who may be frustrated over more protectivist agricultural policies by say Germany and France. So try and use that kind of agricultural gripe to make a division between East and West. Another key one in this is Greece who's joining of the 17 plus one in 2019 was seen as a kind of high point of this platform. Um, a lot was made of this because Greece um, wasn't a former communist state, but 
the scenes of capitalist democracy now seemingly entering um, the orbit of Beijing. This is resulting a lot from uh, China's um, in investment into Pirate Port from 2016. So, so Greece being pulled into this orbit scene kind of as a champion of its success in 2019, of course, two years ago. In terms of how this is validating truth, we can see often being pulled into this orbit, countries, especially Hungary and Greece, are likely to try and block and stop attempts to criticizing China's world narrative and world vision. Um, to try and stop, for example, the um, EU making a statement about claims of sovereignty over the South China Sea, um, trying to stop the EU making statements about China and human rights. So we can see this kind of investment, these carrots, paying off with these states, blocking any criticism of Chinese um, worldviews, blocking criticisms of the truths China wants to propagate. So mass diplomacy a bit more recent. Um, we saw this quite, you know, in the headlines with Italy in particular when the COVID-19 um, outbreak occurred there last year, with it seeming that France and Germany were reluctant to volunteer to help Italy, um, which created a lot of sort of anger amongst um, sentiments of the population that already were kind of anti-EU. So China stepping in here to provide expertise, to provide medical equipment, would seem to be um, an effort to take advantage of this and to reach out, um, China would say in friendship, interpret it as you will, but reach out to a country that um, may be angry at the EU um, and, and try and make inroads there. I mean, other examples as well, we saw Serbia who was um, aiming for EU membership saying, you know, the COVID-19 has showed that European solidarity is a fairy tale, it only exists in paper and only China can help us. And more recently, um, in fact, very recently, Hungary taking shipments of the Chinese um, COVID-19 vaccine, claiming that it was frustrated with the slow pace of the EU rollout, so it's turning to China. And certainly from the Serbia and Hungary narrative, we get this idea that you know the EU is unable to help in a pandemic, and sort of its liberal ethos is making it slow to respond. Instead, they must turn to more efficient China, creating that kind of narrative of Chinese um, Chinese socialism's more efficient response to the crisis compared to sort of Western liberalism. So we see those two kind of examples. How then um, are they being responded to? How are they being received? Well, look at the mask diplomacy first, which maybe was at first going well, and maybe now is kind of maybe backfiring in China in some ways. We saw initially um, equipment donated to Spain and Netherlands was debunked and um, it was criticized as being sent as faulty um, in these countries. There's also the case of, you know, there's this accusation that um, goods donated to Italy, protections, um, PPE donated to Italy was actually donations being sold back. There's that rumor, I've not um, included it because the main source of that seems to be from a, a Trump advisor and does I have maybe the Italians um, in the group can confirm whether it's been collaborated from another source, but it seemed a bit dodgy, so I left it out. What seems to be causing more anger, however, is a more um, hard attempt of China to undermine liberal norms in how they respond to the crisis. For example, the Chinese embassy and posting an essay, sorry, the Chinese embassy in France posting an essay that French carers were abandoning their posts and leaving people to die of hunger and really causing anger um, in France. Also this kind of strange um, sudden move for China to point the finger at Italy as ground zero for the COVID-19 outbreak. This kind of one outreach to Italy as being China's friend and China saying they'll help them and then suddenly seemingly throwing them under the bus when the opportunity arises. The last one I put in here is maybe one to watch out for. Um, there's maybe not been a backlash against it yet. There might not be a backlash, but possibly there will but Hungary is paying 30 euros per dose for the Chinese vaccine, which is making it one of the most expensive in the world, much more than the EU is paying to other um, providers, which makes you wonder, you know, maybe if Hungary gets a fast vaccination um, program and fast rollout, this will pay off. But if it doesn't, and you know, there's this huge cost, maybe this will be another area of um, backlash against China. I should say this um, mask diplomacy backlash is mirrored by a kind of growing apathy in the 17 plus one. 
And this was seen this year when um, Chi himself was going to chair the 17 plus one video summit, but was then snubbed by Bulgaria, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Romania, and Slovenia. What I mean by snubbed is they sent lesser um, officials. They didn't send their heads of state. And of course that is, um, you know, as all um, dealing in China scholarship, we know how important, you know, FaceTime is. So to kind of deny that FaceTime to Qi is, is a huge, huge snub. And then this month, Lithuania then says it might leave the 17 plus one and suggesting it actually might take up relations instead with Taiwan. And this is mirrored by the Czech Republic moving closer to Taiwan. For example, um, canceling its sister city agreement with Beijing and looking for agreements with Taiwan. And of course, this is huge because it's not just you know dying, uh, denying Beijing that face, denying engagement, but in fact, it's directly threatening its ontological security by recognizing Taiwan. So this seems to be sort of a huge change in approach to China. We had this you know high point of Greece joining two years ago, and now it seems there's much much more apathy. So why might this be the case? Well, um, there's three kind of main reasons. One is that you know, much of the investment China promised hasn't really been delivered. Um, one great example of this is Romania, where there's been big offers of projects for China. For example, in 2013, three power plants China said it would help build, none of which have been built. And now um, on the nuclear plant, Romania is even looking for new partners. Also, Poland has been very upset with um, the slowness of opening up the agricultural market. And just in general, there's a real um, view that China's promises haven't been delivered. To kind of fit as well with um, what Mikhail was saying earlier about, you know, you must um, sometimes choose a side. We see this, especially as China is moving um, more toward Russia, that Eastern European countries are thinking they can't be both on the side of the US and the side of China. And with the threat of Russia, with the security threats coming in, they feel it's better to be with the United States than with China. Any sort of economic benefits China offers are outweighed by protection from the US from um, Russia. So that another factor. But one very interesting one, I think, which is really galvanizing this apathy is actually public opinion. And public opinion in Europe is seemingly getting more and more anti-China. Um, and one main reason for this would be the seemingly more authoritarian direction China is going in under Xi. And there's been a lot of argument, especially in Eastern Europe, that many former Soviet states are feeling quite a bit of um, empathy with Hong Kong and with some of the protesters' struggles against, you know, in their views, a communist regime. And this is actually making them public opinion more apathetic towards China, which isn't helped by China's sticks, which are maybe backfiring a little. Um, we see, for example, um, in the disruptions by pro-Beijing supporters um, of a Hong Kong protest in Lithuania, many embassy staff involved, that kind of diplomats and embassy staff encouraging sort of protests against um, or within European states backfiring a bit. Also, sort of when Beijing told um, the, the Speaker of the Czech Senate he would pay a heavy price for visiting Taiwan, that kind of heavy threats backfiring. And that, as I say, it's kind of this galvanization against China public opinion in Eastern Europe. It may be mirrored more widely across the continent as a whole. An interesting one I've been following is the um, Republic of Ireland, which is becoming increasingly critical of um, Beijing, especially on the issue of um, Xinjiang and the Uyghur question. And this has largely seemingly been driven by civil society. The, the Irish press has been very critical of China. Religious leaders have been very critical of China and that pressure from the civil society seems to be being making the Irish government um, change its policy. Um, also, uh, Ireland is one of the very few countries that has a, a positive trade relationship with, with China, which may put it in a um, stronger position. But generally across the continent, we find um, in Germany and Spain and the UK and Sweden, views of China in 2020 coming to an all time low. And this public opinion may be causing a change in policy. So the European strategy, kind of look at the EU's overall strategy in relation to this. Well, since 2019, um, Juncker named it a systematic rival. China is a systematic rival to the EU. And I think that policy is now continuing. Um, how are they combating China then as a systematic rival? Well, one way is providing information and countering narratives from Beijing. Um, I put here sort of clarifying information, so that's emphasis on freedom of information and truth, um, rather than 
sort of more the Trump counter narratives, you know, not that kind of, you know, Kung Flu kind of narratives, more that higher moral ground and truth. More importantly, maybe stressing unity, this idea China must meet this 27, then the 17, okay? So Europe making a united front, and this support also by hardening pressure on human rights issues, which I would argue is driven by public opinion. And I think this again uh, matches what we talked in the last presentation about this kind of higher moral ground and um, this promotion of freedom and sort of values as a response to um, China. I would kind of add to this a kind of caveat of being wary of overreacting. And I think this is maybe what the UK is currently doing when it sort of it revoked the license of CGTN to broadcast in the UK, which resulted in a mirror ban by China of the BBC, of maybe the UK here trying to control maybe fake narratives or narratives it doesn't agree with getting into the UK. However, kind of this kind of censorship, I don't think is, is the great, greatest response, because I mean, at first it could create a Streisand effect where people maybe weren't listening to the Chinese information before, but now Britain's banning it. Maybe there is some truth in it, making people listen to it. Chinese media have already responded to this, saying it proves that Britain is scared of, of the truth of China and it doesn't want this truth getting out. And it also gives legitimacy to Chinese censorship. You know, we can ban foreign broadcasters because they ban ours. So I think, you know, the European Union approach of kind of truth and clarification is the right way. Britons of censorship can only kind of maybe make things worse. And there's a bit of a overreaction and overstep. So kind of just to bring these thoughts together, um, the main thought of this presentation is that China is probably predominantly seeking validations for its worldview, for its truths from European nations, and will offer carrots for these truths to be validated and threaten with sticks if um, they're criticized. Is it trying to divide Europe? I'm not sure that's a European Union accusation. I would say at least it's easier to get validation from individual nations than the bloc. I don't know if that you know, equates to an attempt to actually deconstruct the EU. Europe in response has seen um, China as a rival, um, a stressing unity and clarity and a pushback, pushback against China, the Chinese truths. Um, and I'd say this being galvanized by growing anti-Beijing public sentiment. I would say, however, be careful not to overact like the UK, which could maybe feed into the Chinese strategy and make things work. And as a final kind of thought, this message as carrot and stick is going to work best with states that seemingly are dissatisfied with Europe. And we will see Beijing targeting states like Hungary and Greece and maybe Italy and more. Okay. Thank you very much for um, your time and for the invitation. Thank you very much, Rory, for your very interesting presentation. And once again, I was asking myself many questions while I was uh, I was listening to you. You know, um, well, the first follow up I would say to your presentation is this: I mean, China is trying to, if you want, impose or to be more convincing about its own truth. And I agree with you, we can see it everywhere. And uh, we have many, many examples. You made some, but we could continue with a never ending list of examples going in the same direction. At the same time, which is also true, you were raising the point that there is an emerging and getting stronger and stronger, I would say, anti-China sentiment that is driven not only by the single governments that are dealing with China, but also by public opinion. And then there is a third element that you were pointing out, that is that there is some inconsistency also in the China's truth, because China all of a sudden, as it happened with France, because after what happened with France, France is the country that saved China for, uh, I would say, against the, the, the UK uh, intervention against Chinese television. So, and Italy before used to be one of the very few countries who signed a One Belt, One Road a Memorandum of Understanding, and then it became just the ground zero for COVID-19. So don't you think that this kind of inconsistency could make um, even China's truth less credible in European countries? Absolutely. I think so. Absolutely. Um... I think with to try and understand this because it seems quite erratic was I was thinking that that need to dismiss the truth about um, where the virus came from 
resulted in this almost kind of carpet bomb campaign of China just pointing the finger at anyone it could to try and shift that blame away and whether it you know hurt relations with Italy who is trying to previously make friends with to hell with it you know if it will make that goal and the same with France if the opportunity comes to kind of dismiss those liberal values it'll take it regardless of, of France is trying to to save it what I sometimes wonder is who the audience is of China's narratives at times and I wonder if sometimes you know this accusation of Italy and this accusation of France aren't meant predominantly for French and Italian audiences it's almost maybe a more Asian or even domestic narrative it's trying to build and it's almost like collateral damage and sort of the collateral damage it does to its relations in Europe is worth it to kind of shore up sort of CCP legitimacy in the country itself. Okay, okay, I understand. And I um, I would like once again to, to as a follow up to ask you another thing, because you were also saying, what is China doing? Is China trying to divide the European Union or not? And of course, China will always deny that. But on the other hand, I can see that uh, it's true. I mean, even in this case, China was targeting Italian audience or France audience. There was a time which India also uh, was uh, finger pointed as the ground zero for COVID-19. So it could really target anybody. At the same time, I think that it is in the tradition, if you want, of China's foreign policy, just to try to approach a countries one by one mainly because it's true, China is offering carrots and the carrots is heavier, I would say, according to the country and especially if you or can be heavier or lighter according to the country and according to the, the relationship, especially if you go uh, one by one. So this I think is uh, something that goes in line. We perceive it as an attack to Europe, but in fact, it's just the Chinese way of doing uh, for organizing its uh, foreign relation uh, foreign policy strategy but there's also another thing that i don't understand which is uh, um, china is trying to impose its own narrative we mentioned before that uh, in many many occasions the rest of the world got china wrong so I'm sure China is aware of that because of course, China that can, uh, can better understand itself and its vision can see to what extent the rest of the world is making mistake in analyzing where it wants to go. So do you think that also this erratic narrative and this erratic truth that China is trying to impose is there to further confuse the rest of the world or there is another goal behind that? What, What's the logic, if you can find one? Because I don't think it's easy to. I don't know if I'll find the logic, but I think it appears very erratic to us. I don't know if it would seem that erratic domestically to China. Um, I think there's probably a much more cohesive um, strategy there. And it's more from the outside, it looks erratic. And I think, I think a lot of it is that... Um, we often look at it from the perspective naturally of international relations whereas i'm wondering if china has the same perspective of international relations and its focus is much more on managing you know that kind of idea of china as the center of the world and the circles going out kind of thing and its focus yeah. is very much on that inner circle and its effects then going out and they're of a lesser importance whereas we look at much more sort of you know international relations kind of an international sphere um it actually reminded me a little bit um can't go into this here but you know when you read about the opium war and you talk yeah. you talk about how sort of the british had one perspective of it and the chinese had a totally different perspective and it was almost like the british were rebels of kind of the the order and the focus was much more on that order within china rather than making relations with with britain and i think sometimes you see a bit of this with the sort of covid 19 politics and i'm thinking you know of, of when they said to you know the czech republic you would pay a high price for speaking to taiwan is almost in the same way as they kind of reprimanded sort of the British rebels, and it's not really looking at them as another state. Um, it's again, it's again following that model, and I just wonder again, who is who is the audience here? Is it for you know the Czech Republic to be told you'll be punished, or is it to reassure you know the, the domestic Chinese audience that these people will be punished? You know who who's the audience there? Yeah. And I think maybe missing who these who the intended audience of these threats and these um, claims are is maybe why it appears really erratic for us, but for them, it seems like it's keeping a cohesive um, narrative. 
Okay. okay. Yeah, this could be a, let's say a logic explanation of what might appear as an illogic strategy to a certain extent. Okay. So I think at this point we can, me, I really thank you very much for uh, joining this, uh, this seminar. It has been particularly interesting for me to once again look at different perspective i um i'm very much uh let's say in uh, in line with the with the, the understanding and the presentation that professor goshal uh did but and i think that to a certain extent both uh, all the other presentation were somehow um emphasizing again and again that uh, to understand China, we do need to uh, really reflect on who is the audience, reflect on the condition in the specific countries that China is trying to approach and to the long term and, and uh, medium term consequences that the strategy that China is trying to implement would have in the country and in the region from the Chinese perspective, from uh, the, the concerned countries' perspective, so which makes, let's say, the the, the daily job of Chinese scholar just uh, very, very, very intense and complicated. I think that's the reason why we can focus just on one area and nothing more. But it was really a pleasure to have this, um, let's say, this uh, this privileged um, uh, uh, vision into a look into other regions. I thank you, you very much, and.